So one of the, welcome to another episode of The Shredder Show. Today is an absolute pleasure to have Dr. Suzanne Pierce-Thompson uh, on the podcast. So Suzanne is an expert when it comes to, into all things in regards to, I say in, in particular, probably food addiction, if, that, if that's fair to say, and I think mindset around food and obesity. So this is something that I'm um, very, very hot talking about because I used to be overweight when I was younger. I now very much feel on a mission to try and help other people not make maybe the same mistakes I did. And the older I get, the more I realize that most of these things were because of psychological addictions to food and perhaps maybe the way I was originally brought up. So uh, welcome onto the podcast. Thanks, Charlie. It's great to be here. Um, so initially, obviously, the first thing I've already on the hit off the bat already was talking about the relationship psychology between uh, obviously your mind and getting addicted to food. What first led you down that rabbit hole? And do you think people are becoming more aware of that now? Um, well, what led me down, it was my own food addiction. Um, I was probably addicted to food as a kid, um, almost for sure. Um, and I I developed a little bit of a weight problem, but, um, when I got into high school, when I was 14, uh, I started doing drugs and that, that helped me manage my weight. It was also fun. I was partying and I got quite addicted to the drugs, unfortunately, and they escalated to worse drugs and worse drugs. So speed, crystal meth, and then cocaine, crack cocaine. I dropped out of high school. Um, And all through that time, um, my weight was fairly well managed because those stimulants will really take the weight off you and make you not want to eat. But um, I got clean and sober when I was 20. Um, Very grateful for that. I haven't had a drink or a drug in 27 years. Um, but at that point, my brain was primed for addiction and the addiction just hopscotched right from drugs over to food. So at that point, I, I packed on weight fast and I was obese by my mid twenties. Um, and I, you know, I think what, what happened for me, Charlie is cause I had just recently been in the grips of really bad addiction to crack cocaine where I was, I was prostituting out on the streets at night and then going into the crack house to smoke it all up and spending a few days in the crack house until I ran out of money and then going out to prostitute again. And I had, I was in this addictive loop where I, I really experienced the depths of addiction. And then just a year later, when I was doing essentially the same thing with food, minus the prostitution bit, cause food wasn't that expensive, but I was, I was binging late into the night and kind of going out to smoke a cigarette, coming in, you know, eating more pasta, more cookie dough, more English muffins, more candy bars. And then I'd go out to smoke a cigarette. I'd come back in and I'm watching TV and eating like this. And at some point, uh, it didn't take long for it to dawn on me. I'm not eating. I'm using. I am using. This is this is like drugs. And um, so I was 21 when I knew that I was a food addict. And I think because my story is so extreme, um, you know, I, I kind of got the, these foods are drugs kind of parallel really fast, not, not, um, a metaphor, not, um, you know, a, a, an analogy, but like literally drugs, the sugar and the flour in our food supply are drugs. And so I do think people are getting more open to, um, hearing about food addiction. I think it's becoming kind of, uh, I think it's bordering on common knowledge where we've got a little bit of a headwind with some folks who say that food, food isn't addictive. Food can't be addictive. We've got like counselors and stuff who treat people for eating disorders, who don't like the idea of people having food rules. So they don't like to think of food as addictive because then people are going to talk about abstaining from sugar, which, um, frankly is a good idea. So, Um, you get some resistance there, but I think most people are getting uh, comfortable with the, with the reality that food is truly addictive. I think anyone who doesn't think anything is addictive is incredibly naive because anything (laughs) could be addictive, like sex, traveling, money, uh, power, like whatever it is, like people can go down different rabbit holes of addiction. And then people often swap one form of addiction for another form of addiction. So they might swap um i don't their unhappiness with food they might then just plow that into work to try and get addicted to that get themselves distracted from that or I, I think people need to be very aware of that i think that's probably the key thing most people lack is self-awareness i'd guess yeah and you know it's interesting how you're using the word addiction i think there's it's an interesting conversation to have like where is something an addiction versus a bad habit versus um yeah, like a coping mechanism or something, you know, I use the word addiction quite uh, precisely and in a limited way to refer to the maybe the more extreme 
behaviors, but um, you know, the research that I've seen and some of it I've done myself shows that about a third of the population just aren't susceptible to addictions at all. Their brains just don't wire that way. They don't get the dopamine down regulation that some of us get. They don't have the sort of cluster of traits of impulsivity, uh, poor impulse control, um, oversensitivity. Certain people just don't have that. They can, I mean, God bless them. They can, they can have a cup of coffee when they want one and not need one every morning. They can have a cigarette at a concert and then not go buy a pack. They're just not even even heroin, right? Like you could say, well, everyone would would get addicted to heroin if they did it every day. These people could do heroin every day, and then at the soonest opportunity, they would just stop doing it. Um, and they'd whatever the withdrawals were, they would tolerate them, and they would just get off. Um, so yeah, I mean, lots of things can be addictive for those of us who are predisposed to addiction, and there's good evidence showing that this is genetic. You can look through your family tree and just go like, how many alcoholics have we got, right? How many two pack a day smokers have we got? How many, you know, and that sort of gives you a sense of how susceptible you're likely to be. Um, so is there anything that's like a telltale sign in terms of like certain traits of people having more addictive personalities, even say, for example, uh, ethnicity or where people are located from, or even like, I know uh, there can be differences in terms of people being blue eyed in terms of, uh, brown eyed in terms of their ability to metabolize drugs sometimes like is there anything like that perhaps um no i think it's 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 distributed all over the world i've never seen any studies showing clusters in terms of more banal traits like you're talking about hair color eye color or anything like that uh it does correlate with certain personality traits um in particular uh poor impulse control and <clears throat> uh, a struggle with delaying gratification um, and, um, Q reactivity, which means like the, um, you know, like squirrel, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> um, and, and also there's a little bit of an emotional sensitivity, right? Like, a um, uh, taking things too personally, shall we say, um, right. Uh, tenderness in that way. Um, yeah, but the, the impulsivity is one of the big ones. Coming away from more psychology, why do you think obesity is shooting up all over the world? And then yeah, what can we do question. to try and fix it? Yeah, I think addiction is a big piece. The, the percentage of, of our foods, globally speaking, that are ultra processed is creeping up and up and up and up. And there's really strong data showing that processed foods lead to, lead to weight gain. Processed foods are addictive. They flood the nucleus accumbens with dopamine, which is the same thing that that crystal meth and that cocaine that I used to do did to my brain. Um, it is it is addiction. And so as a greater and greater, we can call it stomach share, right? Market share, whatever stomach share of our uh, of our foods are taken over by these drugs, these ultra processed foods. Um, people are getting hooked and hooked and hooked. There's other things that are happening too, like um, ultra processed foods are less likely to have much protein in them. And protein is the dominant appetite, meaning, so an appetite is, um, is something in your body that drives you to eat. And there are five independent appetites, no more. So there's um, an independent protein, carbohydrate, fat, calcium salt. Those are all separate appetites. Meaning if you're not getting enough salt, you, your body will drive you to eat, to get more salt. Um, but the, the trump card is protein. So that one dominates all the others. If you're not getting enough protein, your brain will drive you to eat more. And so, um, each person genetically needs a certain amount of protein. It varies considerably. Like if your ancestry were Inuit or whatever, you might need 35% of your calories coming from protein. I might need 12% or whatever, or 15%, but a good average is about 15%. And if you look at someone who's eating a processed foods diet, they're, they're getting under that. They're getting 10, 12% of their diet from protein, which means their brain is going to drive them to eat more food so that they get just enough uh, absolute amount of protein, what they need. Um, and actually someone did the research to show, just crunched the data to show that that extra food amount that we're needing 
is exactly enough to account for the obesity epidemic, just the much extra that we're needing to eat to get enough protein in the midst of our processed food diet. So I think processed foods are driving the obesity epidemic. I, there's other factors. I think um, the dissolving of, of meal structure, right? People aren't eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner the way they used to. And that's problematic for all kinds of reasons. Eating around the clock is associated with weight gain, right? You need a good fasting window. So there's, there's factors like that, that I think are in play as well. People are more sedentary, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I think the composition of our food supply is one of the driving factors. I would agree with that massively. And one of the things that, uh, as soon as you said that came into my mind, I was incredibly shocked the first time I went to Texas, I went to Houston and I went to Walmart and I asked, uh, where are the vegetables and like fresh food? And like, oh, we don't serve, we don't sell that here. And I was like, yeah. how can you have a supermarket that doesn't sell that? I was like, so you only sell crisps and sodas. And they were like, yeah. yeah. I was like, yeah. Uh, like yeah. I was, and I was like, literally like dumbfounded. Yeah. Captain Crunch, you can get that over there. But yeah, no apples here. No, we don't eat apples at Walmart in Houston. Do you think the issue here is, so I, I, there's two ways you could try and fix this. The government could either try and obviously put in restrictions in terms of what can be sold or they focus more on education. Uh, education is obviously the answer, but do you think they're actually that that anyone will ever actually do that? Because obviously, from a, I don't know, from a financial point of view, if it works for all the big companies, if you know what I mean. Well, it's interesting. Um, we have a war of big companies, right? So um, our current situation is working just fine for the big food companies. It's not working so well for the big insurance companies. Um, they're paying for people's diabetes and their heart surgeries and all that stuff. Uh, they would love us to find. Uh, you know, a better approach to lifestyle, right? So would all the major companies, you know, the Facebooks and, you know, IBMs of the world or whatever, uh, who self-insure now because health insurance is so expensive. I'm talking about the United States, right? I mean, other countries, um, you know, take care of the healthcare for their citizenry. But uh, in the United States, uh, whoever's footing the bill for people's health insurance um, and, and, and every country who's handling um, ensuring the health insurance of, of their population is super concerned about this. So don't just assume that the big forces are on the side of not caring. There's forces on both side of that, sides of that equation. And interestingly, the UK just um, uh, enacted legislation. I don't think it's supposed to take effect until early 2023, but a watershed um, uh, ban on advertisements to junky foods um, anything with too much sugar, flour, fat, salt, right? Uh, between 5.30 a.m. and 9 p.m. when they're assuming that kids are exposed to media. And that includes online. That includes across the board, not, no TV, no streaming ads, no online ads for anything. Now, it's not a ban on, on um, brands like McDonald's could advertise during that window. They just have to show everybody eating salads or not show anybody eating anything at all. Just, just show their golden arches and leave it at that, right? So um, I do think legislation can have a big impact. I mean, anywhere that they've increased taxes on soda pop drinks, for example, right, sugary drinks, um, sales of those beverages have gone way down. And, you know, that's helpful. So just like legislation helped a lot with nicotine and cigarette sales and stuff, you can't like, I don't know, I don't know what the rules are worldwide, but in the United States, you can't advertise cigarettes just any old where, right? Right. Um, and it helps a lot, right? Like smoking has gone down in the United States threefold, I think. Like it's really plummeted in the last couple decades. So I do think legislation can help. And I think that people getting clear that that this is an addiction, that that this, that these companies are clear that they're addicting us, they know it. They're actually using fMRI machines to track their ads and their snack food concoctions to make sure that the formulation hits the addictive centers of the brain just right. They'll compare two different commercials or two different snack formulations, the taste of them, and then look in the brain to say, does this like just, just blow it up, just light it up perfectly um, before they put it to market? So they know what they're doing. And I think legislation can really help. I don't think education is actually the solution. Generally speaking, people know what they should be eating or not eating. It's a way, and this is, this is my life's work, is helping people learn how to eat in the face of the terrible food environment that we're in. It is possible to beat this game, even in this food environment. Um, but it takes a lot of um, know-how and a lot of effort. And education isn't really the thing. 
Um, people know they should be eating blueberries and not pizza. They know, <laughs> and it's, it's not helping. Do you not think it would help if we, if people had a greater understanding of the basics of how foods worked and how it had impact on your body, do you think? Like no. when I went to school, there was very, very little education on anything like this, or even just, no. even just how calories work. No, you know, it's interesting. You take, you take people, the, the like chronic dieters, they're so educated on this stuff. It'll blow your mind. You hold up a little bit, bit of cottage cheese. They'll tell you how many calories in it. They'll tell you, you know, the macronutrient ratios. They know, they know. And then on Friday night, they'll order a pizza anyway. And it's, it's really an issue of execution over the long term. I do not think this is something we're going to beat with education. I think there are cer certain kinds of education, um, just to be self-serving and completely ridiculously biased here, the kind of education that I provide people about how their brain is working and how when you consume these processed foods, your brain gets hijacked by things like leptin resistance, which is what's causing that weird insatiable hunger people have these days where... Um, no amount of eating satisfies it, right? They can eat a huge dinner and then sit on the couch to watch TV and now they want a bag of chips and then they eat the whole bag of chips and now they think they need some ice cream from the freezer. And it's like, if they, if they ask their stomach, they're not hungry, right? There, there's no, uh, as a matter of fact, they, they're full and they can feel that they're full, but the elbow wants to bend, the mouth wants to chew, like there's this insatiable hunger that's happening in the brain. And it does help when you explain to people that's because of leptin resistance. Leptin is the hormone that tells your brain you're done eating and you're never gonna get that signal until you get your insulin levels down, right? So it does help to teach people that a little bit. Um, mostly to help them understand that it's not their fault, that their brains have been hijacked and they could never lose weight in the circumstances that they've been in. Um, I think it does help to teach people that for some people, a bright line rule against sugar and flour is going to be way more helpful than trying to moderate it, you know, that you're never going to eat cookies successfully um, and, and moderately, right? Like just, just give them up. I think that helps. And I think our society isn't aware of that. The vast majority of people are not aware. They think that, you know, quitting sugar entirely is restrictive and extreme. And so I think there are certain kinds of education that will help, but I don't think basic nutrition information is going to help the, the masses of people lose weight at all, honestly. Here's an interesting one. Why do you think these people don't actually want to, so like, I think about this a lot. I want to help everyone, but like I see people who are super overweight, who like, you know, you're taking tens of years of your life. You're not going to live a long time. How can you make these people wake up and realize that like they literally could be cutting their life in half? I, I, I don't know what you have to do is like throw a bucket of ice water over their face and be like, this is the situation you need to deal with this. I don't know how yeah. much more like harsh you need to be with these people sometimes. And I think we live in a world where, you're almost not allowed to be like that now because we're too worried about upsetting people where sometimes like people will only change if something really bad happens like they end up having a heart attack they survive and like, okay now i actually need to take this seriously yeah even then so here's a shocking statistic i think i have this number right One hundred and thirty thousand people is it one hundred and thirty thousand or one hundred eighty thousand? will have a leg amputated in the united states this year because of their type 2 diabetes One hundred thirty thousand. Okay. yes I think it's 130,000. Yes. Leg amputated this year. Now here's the shocking stat. That wasn't it. <laughs> the shocking stat is 55% of them will have to have their second leg amputated within two years after that first surgery. So good luck with that bucket of ice water. I don't know how much more extreme you can get, you know, sawing off someone's leg. They knew that one was coming, right? So my answer to you is nothing. I don't think there's anything that you can do to make someone want it. There's a, there's a spiritual, emotional rearrangement that can happen sometimes. Like in AA, they call it hitting bottom, right? Like a, a moment of clarity, a spiritual awakening or something like that, where someone says, I can't live like this anymore. I have to do something. Um, I have never seen any way to manufacture that for someone. It, it, sometimes really bad news will do it, a diagnosis of some kind. And then other times it won't, it's, it's really bizarre. You know, you can, you can tell somebody anything you can say, okay, you're going to have to have open heart surgery on Monday. And they're like, okay, you know, and, and they're waiting for the surgery, eating the pancakes that they're serving them in the hospital, right? Like that's the just, irony though, right? It's just, it's just <laughs> right? Like, 
Yeah. And their spouse is like, sweetie, I'll be down in a second. I'm going to go down to the, the cafeteria and they're eating McDonald's in the cafeteria, right? Like, don't get me started. But I don't think there's anything really that you can do. What I do is I try to make sure that anyone who wants a roadmap that works will have access to one. And that's what I think that we can do. I think we can be shining lights of examples where anyone who looks at us goes, you're sparkly. Like, what are you doing? You seem to enjoy your life. You seem to, you know, be comfortable in your body. You seem to be healthy. You're glowing. Um, I want what you have. So I think we can do that. So sometimes it, you know, people can get woken up through inspiration. And then most importantly, there are a lot of people that are looking for a solution, like a solution that works, a potent enough solution, and their brains are addicted. And I want them to find a solution when, when they look. People are praying in the fetal position right now, crying, saying, I cannot stop eating. I just ate, ate my second full pint of ice cream. What is wrong with me? And I want, I want them to have an answer to their prayers. I actually, it's not that I don't care about the people who don't want it. It's more that I respect their choice. If they're going to be like, nah, man, I just want to, you know, eat nachos and drink beer and, and watch the fight, the game, you know, like, that's what I want to do. And I don't really, and I'm smoking my cigarettes too. And I don't really I was about care. to say smoking like, the same thing. Like that's the most proven and drinking to be fair, like. <laughs> You, you yeah. know, it's killing you, but yet you're still doing it. So it's. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, and they could look you in the eye and say, dude, life is fatal. You're not getting out of here yeah, alive. Either, right. So it's like, you know, pick your, pick your, pick your, pick your battle, right. So um, I will say it's hard to live in this current food environment um, and swim upstream against the grain. And I don't, I don't begrudge anybody who decides that they don't want to do it, that they'd rather take their comfort along the way. Dude, that's your choice, but I'm here to help the people who really want want a solution and have not been able to find one. I agree massively. My only thing is when people complain that they they can't is that there's plenty of people like you, like me, who want to help these people. Um, a, a good question for you. How, how do you think social media has uh, affected and impacted the situation? Oh... <sighs> So there's a couple of different ways I would look at this. There's a yeah, I'm a, not sure really. So you go ahead and talk on that first. Well, how do the, you think it has? I think there's two sides to the coin. The side one is there's a plethora of misinformation and bad habits, and also a lot of people, probably more also women, I think, feeling very bad for themselves, getting comparison syndrome, looking at skinny yeah. Instagram models on the beach, and then they're getting anorexia and all these sorts of issues. So I think that's then going to the other extreme of causing massive happiness unhappiness and sadness and i think that's the bad side of it and i think there are some positives in terms of uh freedom of information that's now being shared by other people like yourself for example who are trying to lead by example in terms of providing knowledge and information to help people so i think there's two sides to the coin i think it's um who people choose to listen to if that makes sense yeah i super agree with the comparison syndrome. And um, there's a lot of toxicity out there on social media. And I think, I think one of the other things it's done is it's just um, upped the sort of distraction level enough that it, everything just gets fuzzier and fuzzier where it's like, you know, just like I was talking about a, a fasting window before for food, our brains need that too, you know, and what social media has done is it's gobbled up all of our downtime mentally, you know, just some space. Um, you know, so if you don't, again, it's like, you got to get really proactive to be mentally healthy in that climate. You've got to, you know, plug in your phone somewhere you don't sleep. You've got to develop a meditation practice. You know, you've got to do things actively um, to keep yourself mentally healthy. I would yeah. agree. To the extent of talking about addiction and trying to stay away from technology, I've just ordered a a phone lockbox to actually put my phone in so it's locked and I can't I can't even get like access it to stop yeah. me going to look at messages or Instagram or emails or whatever to keep it away because it's these things are designed by the most intelligent people in the world to get you so addicted that you crave to want to look for like notifications comments like dopamine hit dopamine hit constantly wordle wordle <laughs> yeah literally and like you, you literally is just trying to lure you in constantly it's almost like yeah. a they talk about in the military of like I don't know, someone loses a leg, like phantom limb syndrome, where you feel like you've lost a limb, you can you you can still feel yeah. it. It's like that with your phone, you're trying to like reach around feeling it all the time. 
Totally. Um, and totally. I think that's where people need to become again, like I said earlier at the beginning, of this self-awareness is like a superpower when you become aware of like, I'm spending too much time just looking at this, waiting yeah. for a notification. I need to distance I know, myself a bit. I know people who put nuts in those boxes. Like nuts are healthy, but you can't eat too many of them, right? Yeah. And and you know, past a certain time at night, like they they just can't not eat a handful of nuts, but they want to be able to have nuts in their oatmeal and whatever in the morning. So they put them in the lockbox and then they're only available when it's time to make breakfast. That's smart. <laughs> That's, it's one of the ways though, is to control access to things to some regard. And yeah. It makes a lot of sense totally. outside our mind. Totally. I mean, bright line eating is kind of, it, it's not, it's not as physical a boundary as that, but the whole premise of it sort of goes on that theory that, you know, <clears throat> if you're trying to give yourself extra support around things that are really tempting for you it's way better and easier to just have a rule that you never engage with it ever. It's just the permanent forever. No, you know, like for me, I don't do drugs. I don't do drugs and I don't eat sugar. I just don't. Um, and it's, it's the lockbox in my sort of framework of like, no, it's the clear unambiguous boundary that I just don't cross. Um, and it's just way easier, right? It's like, if you're, if you'd like to drink, and you're going to try to be the designated driver for your friends at a party, it's just going to be way easier if you go into that party saying, I'm not drinking tonight, as opposed to I'll be sure to drink moderately <laughs> so that I can drive everyone home later. Because what does that mean? Right? Like, yeah. Question for you. So to talk about in practical terms, how would someone listening to this who, you th who thinks they may well listen to thinking like they're putting the hand up thinking this is probably me with food addiction. If you were them, how would you look to overcome that? Oh, yeah. Well, the first thing I would do is find out really what kind of brain you have. I developed a, a pretty simple quiz. Um, the items have to do with things like, you know, how much are you satisfied when you eat a regular amount of food? Or do you still feel unsatisfied? Um, do you want to eat more? Um, do you lose control over how much you eat once you start eating? Um, are you spending more time thinking about your food and your weight and all that than you think is probably reasonable? So um, there's five questions. It takes just a couple seconds to, to take probably take you a minute to take it. Um, you can access it at foodaddictionquiz.com, foodaddictionquiz.com. And it's, it'll give you a score from one to 10. So 10 is high. I'm a 10. Um, I actually sometimes call myself a 10 plus plus because, you know, uh, there's five questions and I answer five to everyone. One to five, five, one to five, five, one to five, five <laughs> on every single question. So I'm like a 10 plus plus. But if you're, if you're a five or a six on that scale, then you've got a moderate amount of food addiction in the mix. And it probably is enough to keep you from being successful with your weight loss goals, unless you start to introduce some bright lines into the mix and get yourself some support. I would recommend you read my first book, Bright Line Eating. It will explain how your brain is, um, is working against you. Um, I talked about one of the things, leptin resistance, that causes this insatiable hunger, but that's really one of three major ways that the brain is blocking you from losing weight. It really helps to understand that, and it helps to understand the psychology of it because layered on top of the brain is the mind that is putting all this to words in your own voice, right? It's the voice that says that it's all right. We're just, it's Friday night. We're going to go out and have, you know, beer and wings and pizza with our friends, right? It's, but that voice is coming from somewhere in our brain. And this book explains that progression of what's tweaked in your brain. That's leading to these excuses that you keep making because because the lifetime of failures with losing weight, it's a series of rationalizations that you've been making in your head, thinking that you were choosing the whole time, but there was actually very little choice involved. And neuroscience shows that free will is a tricky thing. Um, so for example, if you're running upstairs trying to hold your breath, you're running upstairs, you're trying to hold your breath, that's what you've decided. Let's imagine there's a bag of 
$2 million sitting up 10 flights of stairs. And if you can hold your breath and run up 10 flights of stairs, you get that bag of money. You're trying to hold your breath running upstairs. I promise you, you're not going to make it. You're not going to hold your breath up 10 flights of stairs. So at some point, your mind is going to convince you to breathe. But you could say you chose to breathe, but that would be wrong. It's really your brain is making you breathe, right? It's because your brain is demanding what it needs. So you've got to understand your brain has had you by the throat this whole time as you've been failing at losing weight. And you got to understand that. So take the quiz, check out the book. And, you know, if you're a nine, an eight, a nine or a 10 on that quiz, you probably want to look at really getting some, a serious level of support. Like, um, bright line eating is just 20 bucks a month and it's, it's, it's worth thousands. Like it's such a potent program. Um, and it'll walk you through step by step by step, how to get free. Makes a lot of sense. What was the big, um, trigger point for you where you felt that you removed food addiction for yourself? Like, was there a moment when you obviously you started working on it where you were like, I've beaten this? Um, no, it hasn't been like that. It's really been, I have fallen back into the ditch with my food at various times over the years and had to get free again. Um, it's, it's relapses possible. It's like, it's always lying in wait there. And if I, the problem with food is it's a really slippery slope, right? It's like a little bit can lead to a little bit more and suddenly, you know, um, so I think with food, the most important thing is to surround yourself with a lot of support and really develop your self-compassion muscle because you're going to get used, you're going to have to get used to resuming, you know, just getting back on track when it just gets ugly and you've just eaten too much of the wrong stuff. Right. Um, so I would not say that I've ever been like, oh, I've beaten this now. I feel that way with drugs and alcohol. I feel like I, I mean, you know, I still go to meetings and stuff, but, um, I don't feel anywhere near having any, you know, drinking or whatever, but with food, it's more, it's a daily practice. It's just a daily practice. I just don't eat that stuff one day at a time. Cause it just doesn't serve me. The same as, uh. I say to our clients and just people in general, like about exercising, training, eating healthy, like it just doesn't stop because yeah, it does. This is a lifestyle. This is forever until you die. Like yeah, when it stops, you die. That's basically it. Like yeah, you have to. You got to become it. someone who just does this. Yeah. You know, and that's why um, we call our members bright lifers. Bright lifers, right? Here we're just here doing this one day at a time. And it really also, when people come in with a lot of weight to lose, it removes the like urgency around it. Like it, it doesn't matter when that weight comes off. You know, it could take six months, it could take three years. So what? You know, you're just doing this every day anyway, you know. Um, yeah. That's uh an interesting thing. And I think that's one of the things I see where which I was just gonna bring up where people they feel guilty, like you said, for overeating. And then they almost try and pull the trigger and go too hard under eat too much, too much exercise. And then getting this hamster wheel that over and over and over again, Monday to Friday, yeah. they almost starve themselves Saturday, Sunday, then then overdo it. And they're just in the yeah. same wheel week after week, after week, after week. Yeah. And the psychology of that, Charlie is, um, there's two kind of archetypes inside of us, right? There's the food controller, part. And then there's the food indulger part, and they really are at war with each other. Um, and ideally what we want to do is not have either of them running our life. We want to kind of step back and, and motivate it all from our highest authentic self where we're not trapped up in the, you know, Oh, you know, now I've got to double down and be extra, you know, extra rigid, extra tightened up, you know, buttoned up. Um, nor do we want to be ruled by that part. That's like, it's all right. It's the weekend. Nobody, you know, it, it, you'll, you'll get back to back on track on Monday. I, you know, just for what it's worth, cause I know you have a heavily exercising community. I actually recommend that people certainly don't start a workout regimen as they're trying to lose weight. Um, but even lay off a bit at the gym when they're trying to lose weight. And the reason is that heavy workouts really burn up your willpower and you've got to save your willpower at the beginning for handling the food. You know, what you weigh is going to be mostly about how you eat. Um, I want you to get to the gym after your food um, regimen is locked in and automatic, but that takes a few months. 
And so for a few months, the exercise piece is not the focus. Um, and if you haven't been exercising automatically, regularly, don't exercise at all. Literally don't. Don't go to the gym. Give me four months to get your food absolutely dialed in. You can start exercising later, but if your food is immaculate, um, that's what's going to get you into a right-sized body for the rest of your life, right? And you have got to get that food dialed into the point where you're not making choices with your food anymore. You're eating your breakfast, lunch, and dinner with the same part of your brain that, that you use to brush your teeth. Like it just happens automatically. You wake up, you brush your teeth, you wake up, you weigh and you measure your breakfast. It's exactly dialed in. And until you get that set up, you will ruin it by hitting the gym too hard. I promise you will, and you'll never get there. What would you say? I'll, I'll agree to disagree completely with that, but um, in regards okay. to people have different <laughs> opinions, but um, when it comes to habit formation, do you have any yeah. tips for people in that respect? Because that's habit obviously the key, they're yeah, creating habits. Yeah. So obviously for you to pick, like, I don't know, for say the guy listens to this, who wants to get six pack abs walking down the beach, for him to achieve that, he has to actually become the person that would be living that lifestyle. So having those daily habits, as you said, of eating certain things, sleeping well, uh, eating well, like working out well, um, yeah. all, all those sort of things. Do you have anything you recommend to people in terms of that? Absolutely. I mean, one of the key things is the cues that trigger you to do the behavior and you want to keep them as consistent as possible. So you want to be doing something not just every day, but at the same time of day triggered by the same antecedent behavior. So in other words, um, I recommend people build a morning habit stack with a series of behaviors where finishing one thing triggers you to do the next thing in the same order, the same way every time so that it, it becomes automatic. It's sort of like when I get into the shower, I've got a regimen. I think most of us do, right? Where there's a certain order that you wash certain parts where you you know use certain soaps and products to do this or that, right? You want your whole morning to be a long extension just like that, where what you're doing is routinized and you could do it, you know, kind of with your eyes closed, you know, half asleep and it wouldn't matter. Um, the more, the more uh, pockets of your life you can automate like that, the better. Morning routine, evening routine, probably some sort of workout routine. Um, get those things automated, you know, same time of day triggered by the same things um, so that it's just kind of part of how you live just part of what you do it becomes who you are it's like uh, i said at the beginning of this so i've just moved to dubai and the big difficult thing for me is getting structure and routine again because yeah. it, it makes you realize how important that is because as you said you do so many things subconsciously you don't even realize so the easier you can get into structure and routine the easier it is for you to be successful with anything and like there's a, a saying i really like and it's uh, structure equals freedom so a lot of people were really resistant to having like a like an adult diary in terms of I go to the gym at I know, 10 o'clock every day, I eat breakfast at 8.30 every day. But when you have a structure of you know exactly what you have to do and when, you don't have to think about anything, you just turn up and do what you're supposed to do. And at the end That's of the right. day, that day's a success. And it's literally as complicated as that. That's right. Totally. And structure equals freedom could be the tagline for Brightline Eating because that's exactly what we do. We just make the food really, really structured like that. And, you know, give me four months and your food will be on point every day. And you'll never be thinking, oh, shoot, you know, my food was off today. No, it's just your food is on every day. Yeah, it just comes down to being and being consistent with it. Yep. Yep. One last question for you. So in regards to, uh, obviously, you talked about mindset and psychology. One of the big things I think we lack in society now is patience. And obviously, people within the weight loss scenario are getting sold every gimmick under the sun by, say, so for example, a supplement company saying, and like stupid tea, tea fat loss companies and all this rubbish um, about losing weight really, really quickly. What would you say to anyone who struggles with maybe they don't see results as quickly as they want and trying to be more patient? Yeah, I see it all the time. I see people saying that they're at a plateau and they're still losing a pound a week, yeah. <laughs> you know, and they're just, they think they're at a plateau and it's like, no, that's a really, that's a really fine. Do, do, do that for 52 out. weeks and that's 52 pounds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, again, I think it comes down to the identity piece when you really are, you know, the impatience is the food controller um, part, right. That just wants these results so fast when, when we're in our highest authentic self and we know that this is a forever thing, we're bright lifers, this is a lifestyle, 
if it's being driven by that kind of deep identity where I'm just going to be a healthy person now, this is how I'm going to live. Again, the rate of weight loss doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I would say um, also community can really help with that. Like in our online support community, you know, you post, oh, I'm so frustrated. I just weighed in and, you know, my weight hasn't budged since last week and it's frustrating. You'll get so much love, so much support. Someone will say that happened to me too. And then the next week I lost two pounds, you know, hang in there. Um, it can really help to have community with you as you're on the journey, but, you know, settle in because it's, you know, life is long. 100%. Uh, to wrap things up, Susan, where's the best place people find more information about you, your books to read? I think you mentioned one of them already. Yeah, I've got um, three great books out there. I would say start with Bright Line Eating um, and then brightlineeating.com. So Bright is B-R-I-G-H-T, Bright Line, L-I-N-E brightlineeating.com and uh, yeah it's just 20 bucks a month give it a try you know awesome pleasure thank you so much for your time um and we'll wrap that up there so if anyone who enjoyed this make sure you leave a five-star review check out suzanne and make sure you subscribe to the podcast and drop us any comments or questions on youtube uh, in regards to other products we just released the free 59 fitness uh, myths ebook which you can get a copy of that free below this podcast so get that and that should help you throughout the rest of the year with your fitness journey and we'll catch up with you next episode.